the mic is now on. Uh, my name is uh, uh, Michal Jantowski, and uh, for the last eight years, I've been the director of the Václav Havel Library in Prague. And thank you, Rafael, for your introduction. You saved us uh, some time. Uh, so I can delve uh, immediately into uh, resistance and solidarity, which is so great an infinite topic that uh, I don't really know how to start, or I didn't know until I tried to map uh, the territory for me and our uh, panelists uh, a little. Obviously, we will have an opportunity to compare different uh, expressions of the ideas of resistance and solidarity in different regimes and situations, and more on that later, but first, a, a short introduction. First on resistance. You know, when we speak about resistance, uh, we usually speak about the big stories. We speak about the heroes and the martyrs of uh, resistance, and it's important that we do, but uh, we often have no time left for the smaller stories, and it is a task of historians to cover the various layers of uh, uh, resistance such as they evolved in, in history. Obviously, resistance can take a, a radical or even a violent form. The wartime resistance movements uh, in Poland, in Czechoslovakia, in other European countries are cases in point. More controversially, some of the movements of the radical left and radical groups in the 1970s and 1980s, such as the Red Brigades and the Bader Meinhof uh, uh, group are, although also thought of themselves and view themselves as movements of uh, resistance. But we have a more extensive experience, at least in our part of Europe, with uh, the nonviolent uh, forms of uh, political uh, resistance uh, of these opposition groups, uh, like uh, the Committee for the Defense of the Workers in Poland uh, in mid 1970s, the Charter 77 movement in Czechoslovakia, the Committee for the Defense of the Unjustly Persecuted the Solidarność uh, movement in, in Poland and others. And all those are forms of political resistance. But equally important or quite important in our and in my experience were the forms of, uh, of cultural uh, resistance uh, in the forms of books and films and uh, essays and poetry, prose of people like Czesław Milos uh, Václav Havel, uh, the films of uh, Miloš Forman and the Czechoslovak New Wave, Andrzej Wajda, but also perhaps Juan Antonio Badem and, uh, and other uh, uh, filmmakers closer uh, to here. Then, and it's a different perspective uh, from Central Europe and I suppose in Spain and other countries, uh, religious resistance played quite an important part in bringing the uh, totalitarian uh, regimes down. They partly, the dissidents and the resistance uh, movements or groups were partly sheltered, partly supported by the Catholic Church in Poland, the Protestant Church in uh, East Germany, and elsewhere, but in other countries this did not apply. An interesting case in point are the modes of resistance in what we call the gray zone. And uh, uh, there are enormous and quite interesting stories about the resistance activities in 
uh, things like uh, scout movement, boy scouts movement in psychiatry, uh, later in the 1980s in environmental groups, uh, and so on and so forth. They also played a role. There also was the original idea first uh, coined by a Czech uh, dissident, Václav Benda, of the parallel polis, which had uh, uh, manifestations, similar manifestations in different countries, and, uh, and it mainly meant uh, the avoidance of a direct conflict with the totalitarian regime, instead creating networks which were free and independent of the system. The second culture, the underground culture, the parallel education uh, networks, the underground universities and, and schools that we remember, parallel economics and parallel uh, politics. Interestingly, uh, they have uh, this kind of thinking has a very uh, unlikely offshoot in existence today. The uh, uh, proponents of cryptocurrencies often refer to the parallel police idea and to Václav Benda as a guru of the uh, cryptocurrency uh, idea, although he had, as far as I know, he had no such uh, idea himself. But together, all these groups embody the origins and the growth of uh, what Václav Havel in his most famous essay called The Power of the Powerless. Yeah, you know, different kinds of organizations, activities, styles, and uh, uh, degrees of uh, radicalism that uh, in the end work together to bring the edifice of the totalitarian system down. But that much on on, uh, on resistance. Now on solidarity. Uh, also an interesting stratification here um, in uh, uh, it seems that there are actually two types of solidarity. In evolutionary psychology we speak of two types of altruism. One that we call the reciprocal altruism which is a practical kind of solidarity based on the idea that if I help you today, or if I help the others today, you know, others are more likely to help me in, in time. And then there is the second kind, the moral altruism. And uh, uh, this is, I think, very well illustrated by an idea of a Czech philosopher, Jan Patočka, uh, a sort of a one of the first uh, spokesmen for the Charter 77 and one of its inspirations, who spoke of the solidarity of the shaken. Yeah? And the idea of the shaken means an individual whose everyday assurances have been overturned by a deeply shocking moral experience, seeing other people suffer other people uh, uh, killed, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and uh, and much of what we saw in the resistance movements in Central and Eastern uh, Europe in the 1970s and 1980s stemmed out from this kind of uh, of solidarity, the solidarity of the shaken, and. Uh, the solidarity works across uh, different lines and different borders. It works inside the societies. And uh, in Czechoslovakia, for example, unlike in Poland, where the Solidarność movement was a massive, uh, uh, big, big movement with hundreds of thousands uh, uh, members and supporters, the resistance movement in Czechoslovakia was actually quite small. It uh, numbered in thousands or ten of thousands at maximum 
people. But it depended on a large network of uh, solidarity, both material, moral, uh, help, uh, ver various kind of refuges in, in mental institutions, various kinds of avoidance of the military service, the draft, etc., etc. All those were expressions, practical expressions of uh, solidarity which helped. Then there was the solidarity between societies, between countries. Uh, uh, again, in our case, because it's the case I know best, uh, uh, starting with the protests in the Red Square in Moscow following uh, uh, the invasion of Czechoslovakia by the Warsaw Pact armies, you know, a uh, uh, incredible act of bravery and courage by eight uh, uh, Russian uh, uh, personalities, uh, continuing with uh, actually a number of cases of self-immolation in protest against uh, the invasion, not just uh, the Jan Palach uh, sacrifice in Prague, but also Richard Siewiec's uh, sacrifice in, 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 in Poland, uh, Vasil Makuk in Kiev, who actually died protesting the invasion of Czechoslovakia and, and shouting Slava Ukraine. Yeah? He was uh, an early supporter of uh, uh, Ukrainian independence. Sandor Bauer in, in, in Budapest or Eliyahu Rips in, in, in Riga. And one of the best documented of examples of this kind of solidarity between captured societies is the Polish-Czechoslovak uh, solidarity, which became quite famous for several clandestine meetings of leading dissidents, including Václav Havel, Petr Ulada, Michnik, Jan Letinsky, Antoni Macierewicz, Piotr Naimsky, <laughs> my neighbor on the left, or Jacek Kuroń, on the top of the mountain range which divides Poland and, and Czechia. But it didn't start there. It was preceded by a series of mutual declarations of support of the dissident groups uh, of the Committee for the Defense of the Workers and Charter 77. And it was followed up by a long list of joint clandestine activities in the 1980s, many of them organized by a group in Wroclaw, uh, led by Miroslav Jasinski and, uh, and others. So this is quite, a, you know, Great story it is. And finally, and I will close on, on that, uh, there were also important expressions of solidarity from the outside, from countries in the West which uh, enjoyed freedom, had the material resources to help, and found people and organizations to help. You know, the support from human rights groups, uh, from famous intellectuals and writers, from trade union groups such as AFL-CIO uh, to Solidarność, uh, as opposed to many Western governments which uh, 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 promoted, at that time, promoted detente and uh, Ostpolitik and uh, other policies designed to conduct business as usual with the communist governments, and you know it rings a bell at the present, yeah. and I think really this issue is becoming very topical in the light of the general failure of the West to support the opposition and the anti-war groups in Russia itself, because there must be, and there are people like that in Russia, and thus enabling the Putin regime to persecute them, isolate them, and make them practically invisible. And I will end up with, uh, Another idea in the legacy of Václav Havel, the duty to resist evil, the obligation, the moral obligation to resist evil even if we are not ourselves directly affected by, uh, the, uh, by the evil. Uh, and this idea in my mind cannot be subjugated uh, to an understandable but 
often self-defeating desire to making peace, even with people who are our enemies. So we have a lot to discuss in the next hour or so, and at the end of the debate, I will open the discussion to the floor, and we have two excellent panelists to do it. Uh, Dr. Kamen Magayon, the director of the Peace Research Center in Zaragoza, uh, committed with the advancement of women through researching their contributions to two important fields, science and peace. And also president of the Spanish section of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. Uh, welcome, Dr. Magayon. Dr. Piotr Nemsky, former member of the anti-communist opposition, one of the creators of the Workers' Defense Committee in Poland that I already spoke about, a Polish academic and politician who served in a number of parliamentary and government positions, but more importantly for the purposes of this discussion, he was one of the leading figures in the Workers' Defense Committee in Solidarność during the years of communist uh, oppression. Obviously, our two speakers come from different vantage points and different perspectives, but that should make our discussion even more interesting. So let them speak for themselves. Piotr, you agreed to... So. Yeah, okay. okay. So you so. must have made uh. another arrangement in the meantime. Please, Carmen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me to this conversation. Uh, bona tarde, uh, buenas tardes, good afternoon. Uh, I will speak in Spanish because uh, my English is not so fluently enough. So um, I will speak in Spanish. Um, my generation went through and experienced the latest years of Frankism at the university, and we were a generation who resisted. We resisted from clandestine political parties. And interestingly enough, and compared to my other members of the panel, is that here, communism was prohibited by Franco, by the dictator. Therefore, we have to recognize that one of the groups who resisted the most was the members of communist parties. And then we didn't know anything about what real communism was, but we have to recognize this. And little by little, we discover what communism was. I was a student of physics, and the first time our generation uh, learned that we belonged to Europe and that we had a relationship of solidarity with the other countries of Europe was in the 80s when we were united against the destruction imposed in nuclear weapons. During the 80s, my city, Zaragoza, who had a military, US military base, we felt threat, threatened by a nuclear bomb. That was the madness strategy of uh, ensure mutual destruction. And in Europe, there was a very powerful movement uniting the different countries in order to search for the end of nuclear weapons. That was the history of the position of different missiles in European floor with the capacity to reach quickly to the other extreme of Europe. And we, those in favor of peace, members of my generation were coming from the anti-dictatorship resistance to pacifism. Why? Because we wanted parties. We were all excited about having parties that had been prohibited during Franco, but then those political parties deceived us. There was deception. Uh, however, within this movement for peace, we found a movement uniting 
uh, our objectives with meaning, with uh, significance, which made meaning uh, to our lives, neither with the West nor with Eastern countries, but we want to defend life. And here, I would like to talk about my source of inspiration in order for me to become a pacifist. These were my grandmothers from a remote village of the province of Teruel, which, as you know, was one of the areas where the Spanish Civil War was hardest. Alcañiz, Teruel, there, the front was present, then first the Republicans, and then Franco arrived. My village, Alcañiz, was bombarded back in 1938. Uh, so the bombarding started in all the villages of Aragón till the seafront in order to stop the advancing of the troops of the Republicans. And in Alcañiz, small village, 500 people were killed. And we never knew who had bombarded Alcañiz. Some people didn't say it, and those were uh, the Italians. They didn't say it in order not to feel guilty about these deaths, and the other ones because they didn't want to demoralize their own ranks. Therefore, we had to wait until uh, the day that the researcher a researcher talked about this history of the bombarding of Alcañiz we didn't know. Let me go back to my grandmothers. One of the challenges for this type of symposiums is to recover the memory of women, and I would like to greet the exhibition of those women who contributed to building Europe that you had placed downstairs, but the memory of European women is much richer, and it's a memory that we can study from two different perspectives, from a negative perspective, all the suffering they went through, all the barriers they had to overcome in order to enter into universities, to access those rights that were denied to them, but also a positive perspective, how much they contribute with to history, and I'm very interested in the positive perspective. My research has been driven towards recovering the contribution of women to science and to the construction of peace. In fact, in this law of democratic historical memory here in my country, we are working in order to name some of the research centers to name those scientific women who had to go to exile during the civil war, and uh, not only men, but the first Spanish scientist in the Republic that nobody know, knew about until we recovered them. Let me go back to my grandmothers. What did they teach me? They belong to the line of the daily resistance. And what did they do? And what do many women do during wars? Well, they do something which is necessary to recover, which is to keep life alive. And my grandmothers used to tell me with terrible anecdotes, but very positive. And they used to tell me the following. One of my grandmothers used to live in a house in the fields. It's called Masia in Catalan, this typical constructions. And the Republican, Republican troops were there. When they had to exit, my grandmother prepared a meal for the soldiers who were living. And when the Franco troops arrived, my grandmother fed them. Feeding somebody stops them from being aggressive. To feed somebody is very important. So I think that memory consists not only in 
recovering what the politicians and members of societies have been able to do, but also this memory of the daily life and what's important to recover. Therefore, this is a perspective from another paradigm, the paradigm uh, which allows us to see different things. So my grandmother's paradigm was keeping life, preserving life, and this paradigm, let me now go back to a writer, Virginia Woolf, who taught us so much. When she was sent pictures about the Spanish Civil War, she said, when asked, what can women do to avoid war? Wolf said, the best thing we can do is avoid repeating the words and the methods used by men, men in power, that is. So going back to this remembrance is like preserving social biodiversity. Because as women, we can act as one more man or not. I'm not being essentialist here, but it's important to remember the legacy of peace builders, a legacy that dates back from 1915, when during First World War, women from different countries of Europe German women from Belgium, from the UK, and even from the US, they gathered in The Hague to suggest measures aimed at stopping the war. We're speaking about the first women conference where the International League for Women and Freedom was born, so men back then were killing each other, and women were capable of opening a dialogue. So this legacy, this capacity to overcome barriers dividing us is very important, because in conflict resolution theories, what matters the most is being able to criticize your own group and being able to engage with others. And I believe that the memory of European women has to be incorporated in the memory of resistance and solidarity. My grandmothers were illiterate. One of them was a self-made woman. She learned how to write and read. And the history of my family again is a dramatic one. One, one of my grandmother's siblings was assassinated during the Spanish Civil War, and others went into exile. My dad was a fighter in the Spanish Civil War. He, he was wounded, but he survived. So this is the drama we are speaking about. This is what the war is about. And this is what made me a pacifist. This is what brought me to, willing, to be willing to recover the contribution of women to peace building and to science, because actually the first women who started reflecting, re reflecting about war and conflict from another perspective were the first judge of Germany, the first Dutch doctor, the first women who started carrying out a research about war from other paradigms. In science, it is often times said that the change of paradigm in science are always promoted by young researchers who are not contaminated by all paradigms. Women in many times in history have not been, well, they have been subordinated and discriminated, which means that they have not been, let's say, force the thing from the logics of the existing powers. It is important then to recover the heritage of human biodiversity. When it comes to women scientists, we have been working and interacting with women from different countries, also in the field of pacifism. I know that. 
In Eastern European countries, Western pacifism movements were seen in a, let's say, not necessarily positive way, but well, I'm going to leave it here. Thank you. share your closing point. If it were not for the biodiversity, none of us would be here. So, uh, and also, if it were not for the cultural diversity, which informs us uh, from one end of the continent. Uh, sorry, again, uh, from one end of the continent to another. But I have spoke for long enough. Now is uh, the turn for Dr. Piotr Nyomsky, Naimsky, I'm sorry, Naimsky, and the uh, floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me <laughs> to this conference. You see, I feel myself sometimes as kind of an artifact. <laughs> uh, you see, you know, 50 years, 50 years ago, more than 50 years ago, I was uh, 17 when uh, 68 uh, happened. Uh, uh, not only in Poland, but I would like to stress that it was a different 68 in Poland, in Czechoslovakia, and in Western countries or Western universities. Uh, let me touch one already mentioned important thing, the b resistance background. Because uh, there are differences. I mean, different backgrounds, and uh, different resistances. Resistances against uh, different oppressors or oppressions. Uh, probably this uh, meeting today is really very good one because we can confront experiences, uh, completely different experiences in Spain and in uh, uh, oppressed by Soviet communism countries, Poland among them. In Poland, we started to be oppressed by Soviet, not in 45, 1945, but 1939 or even 1920. You know, if I may mention, because we are mentioning our grand, uh, grandfathers or grandmothers, my grandfather volunteered and uh, went to front during war with uh, Soviet Russia, 1920 in Poland, defending Poland. Actually, fortunately, we won at that time. There is no room in Poland for pacifist movement. We have to be prepared. We have to defend actually relatively often our independence with arms. After the Second World War, as uh, Winston Churchill said, Iron Curtain for dividing the European continent and we happen to be on the wrong side. I mean, side oppressed by communists. And the background of resistance in Poland is based on anti-communist activity. First, it was uh, armed resistance from the underground army fighting communists after the Second World War in Poland till early 50s. The memory of these brave Poles was abandoned by 
of course, ruling communists in Warsaw. So if we are talking about remembrance, in Poland, it means that we started to recover memory of those heroes from 40s and early 40s, 50s. And then we have series of spontaneous uh, eruptions of resistance against communist regime in Poland, starting with 56 uh, crushed by tanks on uh, uh, streets of a big city in Poland, Poznań. And then we had 68, which was uh, the eruption of opposition among intellectual student circles against uh, a communist uh, approach to the cultural heritage in Poland. Students, they fought for uh, 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 against censorship in Poland. Uh, in December 70, I was already, already 20 years old. It was eruption of strikes in Polish cities Gdańsk, Szczecin, Elbląg. And this was crushed by army and police. Many people were killed on the streets. The memory legacy of these events were deeply rooted in our memory in 76. In 76, once again, People rise in the factories close to Warsaw, in Radom, in other places in Poland, many places, dozens of places. Once again, the communist regime decided to crush this with uh, force. This time, they were people in, I mean, not only in Warsaw, but in some other places. Not many of them, but we decided that this time we had to react. We had to react non-violent way and open way because we knew perfectly well that communist, communist regime, communist secret police and police, they are prepared to crush underground or clandestine organizations. So we decided to go openly. We decided to create this organization or committee, we called it committee, committee, uh, of workers' defense, actually, you see, I'm, uh, the name of the committee may suggest that we were people, I mean, basically from the left. We were not. But we wanted to create a link between intellectual circles, intelligentsia intelligence circles, and people working in factories. So we decided to organize assistance to those persecuted. We started to collect money. We provided law uh, lawyers uh, assisted, uh, assisting them during trials, and so on and so on. And the uh, communist regime, I mean, communist party, got surprised by this kind of action. They didn't know how to react at the moment. I mean, actually, during first year. 
and this gave us a certain room for activity, and uh, we succeeded. We succeeded because all people, even sentenced for years or 10 years of prison, they were released after a year. So it was beginning of organized, anti-communist, non-violent movement in Poland. And then, it was something really surprising happened. Karol Wojtyła was elected the Pope. The John Paul II came to Poland in 79, and it was something really, really unique. For the first time since many years, Poles were able to gather on uh, open squares in Warsaw, he gave a mess and uh, they were thousands, thousands of people. I was there. We felt something really strange. We felt that we are not alone. Not only because, you know, the Pope, our Pope came to Poland, but also because we were among thousands of thousands of Poles thinking the same way we were thinking personally. So it gave really certain spirit to many, many people involved, and not necessarily involved in this anti-communist uh, organizations or movement. But if we are talking about solidarity in Poland as the movement, one of the major roots of this movement is this spirit coming from the Pope's visit. One year later, once again, workers started to strike. First in Gdańsk, then all over the country. And uh, it was kind of a, I mean, solidarity was, in the name of solidarity, name of the movement, was uh, decided not during the strike, but after, after the victory, after the end of August 1980, when, when uh, the authorities decided, you know, differently than before, to rather negotiate and wait uh, than to send troops. It was another victory. And, uh, and you see, uh, the solidarity was, I mean, solidarity movement was national movement, was movement for independence, organized as a trade union, but not mixed, you know, let's say regular trade unions uh, with, uh, with, with solidarity as the organization. Solidarity at a certain moment in 19, uh, 1981 had uh, almost 10 million participants. 10 million participants. So uh, it was national movement resistant toward communists and fighting for independent Poland because independent Poland was something which was, I mean, uh, described goal for the movement. Of course, bread is important, salaries were important, but as important was demand for 
a mass, Catholic mass every Sunday on Polish radio, which stays till now at 9, PM, 9 a.m. And, this, and, and also, you know, same importance has demand of, uh, 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 of uh, finishing censorship in Poland. And it happened then. So the resistance in Poland means today and meant for years before resistance against communism, purely, point. So when we realized that, for example, mentioned by you, peace movements in Western Europe in the early 80s against crisis, American crisis in, in uh, uh, missiles uh, in uh, Europe, in uh, Western Europe, we got to know very early that these movements consisting that, uh, with uh, uh, good will people, mainly, many of them, but these movements were maneuvered by Soviet agents, and it was proved after. So, you see, I mean, there are different experiences, different, uh, different oppressors. If I may turn to, because uh, we started today with uh, uh, trying to, 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 to find some definition or defin definitions. Or, so, John Paul II, being several times in Poland, being the Pope, he tried to explain to us, to Poles, what solidarity means. And he was very simple, repeating St. Paul and saying, go on carrying the burdens of one another. And one thing else I would like to add is that solidarity sometimes could be mixed with moral obligation. Moral obligation is something else. Sometimes it's a common ground between solidarity and moral obligation. But moral obligation is much, much deeper. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Piotr, and, and thank you in particular for ending on this uh, notes about morality because I think this may be where the solution lies because on the outside it looks like on the two sides of the panel we have a considerable degree of difference and uh, uh, disagreement for you the communists were good for us the communists uh, were bad, for you the uh, uh, unilateral uh, nuclear disarmament movement was good, for us it was terrible because if the West unilaterally disarmed, which the Soviets had no intention of, of doing, then you know, uh, you would be defeated and we would be defeated uh, with you, etc, etc. So, uh, is there any way to reconcile these two perspectives? And already last night when we were having a dinner, I thought of a, of a story because all resistance and all solidarity is made up of stories that may suggest the common ground. Uh, there was a man named František Kriegel, born before the war in Czechoslovakia. He was a physician. Uh, he was a pre-war communist uh, in the 
pre-war communist party, which did not have any power in Czechoslovakia. And in December 1936, he got up and joined the international brigades in Spain and uh, uh, fought on the front as a physician, achieved uh, a rank of major, and after the defeat of the Republican cause, he crossed the Pyrenees to France, but could not go back to Czechoslovakia because it was already occupied by the Nazis. So he went to Shanghai and joined the Chinese army fighting the Japanese. And then he moved to India and joined the American army uh, uh, fighting, fighting, fighting the Germans and the, and, and the Japanese there. After the war, he came back to uh, Czechoslovakia. Regrettably, he uh, was a part of the communist uh, party that took over power in a coup in 1948 in Czechoslovakia. And, uh, he, for a time, had you know, some features and signs of a loyal Stalinist in the 1950s, but gradually he changed his mind about communism and became a reformist. And in 1968, he was already a leading reformist uh, in Prague. And when the Soviets invaded, Czechoslovakia in 1968, he was taken together with Alexander Dubček and the rest of the communist leadership uh, to Moscow and, uh, and was detained there. And he turned out to be the only member of the Czechoslovak communist leadership who refused to sign the protocol that basically gave up Czechoslovakia to to Soviets, at which the Soviets uh, uh, said they would not let him go back, that he would disappear somewhere. And fortunately, the rest of the delegation refused to leave without him. He came back to Czechoslovakia, and he became one of the original signatories of the Charter 77, the resistance human rights movement that brought the communist regime down. A full circle, and, uh, and that resonates with what Piotr said at the, at the end about the, the power of morality and what Václav Havel said about the obligation to resist injustice. You know, what was happening for us from the perspective of my father, my ancestors, in Spain in the second half of 1930s was uh, injustice uh, waged against uh, an elected Republican system. And what was happening to us in 1970s and 1980s was an injustice waged by a very cruel communist system in Central and Eastern Europe. But the morality of the story is the same. Yes, uh, I want to say that we can find a common ground if, if we go to deep experience of people. Because, for instance, church. For you, church was a way to liberation, to, to build this spirit of we are not alone. But for us, for Spanish people, church was this institution who blessing, blessing the dictatorship. So uh, it's the different. Women, the women that you called so many priests were killed by common church. Yes, one of my, the, the brother of my grandmother was, was uh, shot by communist anarchists or whatever during the, the war. Priest, a priest, priest, priest was a priest shot. Yes, yes, was a priest. But uh, 
I meant uh, the institution, the institution of church was supporting dictatorship here. But we, what we have in common is that people were oppressed by communists or by the dictatorship one or dictatorship two. So the common ground is fighting and resistance against dictatorship. And we were looking for freedom, and you were looking for freedom, and many ways to go to Roma. <laughs> there are many ways to go to Roma. And your way was... I know, I know where is the difference. I, one of the differences is, is, uh, is because uh, you, as you are saying, you are fighting, you, you, you are fighting dictatorship uh, in Spain, but this was Spanish. Uh, talk but to, yeah. It is on. <laughs> you were, oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> you, were f you were fighting dictatorship in Spain, uh, indigenous dictatorship. We were fighting communists as uh, foreign oppressors. Mm. It makes difference, I believe. Okay, there were some Poles communists uh, established by uh, Russian communists in Poland, but they were traitors of the nation. Mm -hmm. The nation was against them, right? It makes difference. Yes, <laughs> uh, what I meant is daily life, daily life of your people and my people were lacking freedom, lacking rights, lacking, and this is common to you and to us. Daily I, life. That's right. That's right. Oppressed. But, but you see... Uh, the and, uh, sorry, but uh, I don't uh, accept that pacifist people are wishful thinking people. We have a propose, and the propose is uh, more um, is for the future. But I understand the reticence of you in front of the big ideas because you were vaccinated. We are buying in, front in of Poland. The big ideas. We are buying in Poland, uh, you know, armed vehicles, tanks, uh, planes, and so on because we have to be prepared. Mm -hmm. There is a war on our border, well, if created I, by Russians, post-communist Russians. If, my, <laughs> if, I may offer, if I may offer another perspective, is uh, um, it's, it's on. It's on. Yeah. It's on now. Yeah. Uh, if I may offer another perspective, you know, it's... Uh, uh, what seems to me lacking in some of these discussions is the moral complexity of, of, of the stories. And uh, we, in going back into the past and into m remembrance and, uh, and memory, we have to deal on our part with some of quite painful events in our history. And some of them have to do with the Czech-German uh, relationships. The Nazis, the Germans, during the Second World War have committed well-documented atrocities against uh, our people. They murdered 92% of our uh, Jews, and so on and so on. After the war, as a retribution, we expelled from Czechoslovakia three million Germans who had been living in the country, some of them for centuries. And some of them were obviously Nazi collaborators, but most of them, or a large part of them, were you know, women, children, old people. They were not guilty of, of, of anything. So it was a, an example of collective guilt. And I, and since 
1989, we have done a lot of work on both sides to explore what really happened in those years, who committed what, uh, what was the German guilt and blame, what was our part of the, of the blame, and so on, and so on. And, and the result is a much more plastic uh, picture of history and of memory. And uh, Carmen, I, I, I apologize for you know, having uh, uh, to ask this, but in my imperfect memory and knowledge of uh, the Spanish history in the 1930s, I think uh, one thing that stands out that there were uh, injustices uh, committed on both sides of the, uh, of the Civil War and that on the Republican side of the Civil War, it was quite often not a matter of fighting Franco, but of fighting the other factions in, 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 inside, inside the Republican camp. So uh, my question to you is how, uh, how deep are Spanish historians and the public Will, how deep are they willing to go into these complexities? Because there will be more complexities there. Um, <clears throat> yes, uh, this is a complex question. Um, it's true that the two parts committed uh, crimes during the war. Um, for this, uh, the stories of my grandmother were plenty of them. Hmm? And maybe for that reason, maybe I am traumatized, traumatized but uh, is this like that? In these uh, years, they, don't, they didn't think we, we were ch ch children. So, but the question is that after the war, Franco, the dictatorship, go on killing people, killing. And uh, after the dictatorship, after the war, uh, there are many people who lost their mm, position at the university. They have to go to exile, and uh, uh, they lost uh, everything because uh, only the, the, the winners of the war were, were in the power. In power, so. And it's true that in this country we we we, we are not uh, over override the trauma because we are again divided. And nowadays there are people who says that uh, uh, the Republica was uh, was the, the the what you say don't no that the Republica. Uh, mm, was uh, responsible for many things, for many things, and even before uh, the war began in the 1934, uh, there are many, many positions. So, um, some people says that open the mm, mm, las tumbas mm, is the graves, open the graves, is open the wounded, the, the heridas, no? Uh, and it's, it's this discussion because some, um, some uh, countries, for instance Germany, I think they have a common, uh, a common vision of the past. We don't have this common vision. I don't know what do you, what you think about. about eh? We don't have this common vision. We have to reconcile ourselves. Mm. Mm. But it's for this that I... Uh, thinking from this legacy, legacy of these uh, peacemakers, women peacemakers, we have to reconcile ourselves and with you and with everybody. And these days, I went to a play, a theater play in Madrid, as uh, based in one thing from Federico García Lorca, uh, La Canción del Primer Deseo. Y 
the play reflects very well this. The, the, the play explained the shot of people going out of the mess of the church during the Civil War. And also, the play reflects how many people uh, still don't, know, don't have the body, the, the corpse of his family, of their family. But they are one saying, don't, two mothers, they say, we are mothers. We have the same desire, is that this happened never, ma, never more. So, and in this, uh, it's for this matter that I always think that weapons will not save us. Weapon is not the solution. Uh, well, you know. But sometimes it's necessary. Uh, we ourselves. Weapons are not a solution unless the, somebody's about to kill you. Then, you know, what, yeah. can, what can you do? No, I, I'm not going into that. Uh, I think but it's... If I, may, but if, I may, if I may add something, right? Very short. You see, uh, these days, I mean, uh, during last year, after Soviet uh, Russian, this time, Russian invasion to Ukraine, we decided spontaneously in Poland to support Ukrainians. Every possible mean. Every possible mean. Uh, this is based on, uh, on one side, on the uh, our, on our interest, Polish interest, because we know that Ukrainian uh, state disappearing on our border means that we'll have border with Russia. So we defend ourselves on Ukrainian fields. This is first. But also, there is an uh, idea, I mean, not new idea. This is a very old idea of Polish-Ukrainian uh, cooperation, including, about including Ukrainians uh, or Ukraine to Polish Commonwealth during First Republic where we have a commonwealth with Lithuania, Grand Duchess of Lithuania. We had a lot of problems between us. Remembrance is a necessary background to uh, these uh, ideas being uh, uh, part of uh, practical or basis for practical doings. It means also that we have to remember those about 100,000 Poles killed by Ukrainian nationalists in 43 and 44 uh, during the Second World War, where eastern part of Poland was under uh, German occupation, but Ukrainian minorities there were active, national, and they decided about ethnic cleansing, uh, killing Poles. So we have to remember about that. We have to admit it. They have to admit it. And this is necessary for future cooperation. And I believe that we are able to pass this uh, very important and uh, difficult moment. Yeah. No, absolutely. Uh, unexplored history inevitably comes back to haunt you. That's the experience you had, we had, everybody else had. And, uh, and uh, I don't want to repeat 
every time what Santayana said, but if we don't remember our history or don't know our history, we are committed, condemned to repeating it. That's, uh, that's uh, one general lesson from this. And now the second general lesson is that I promised there will be an opportunity for uh, the audience to uh, make their contributions and ask questions. So, Marcus, please, you start. Thank you. Markus Meckel, Markus Meckel from Germany. Um, Piotr, I uh, wanted to tell you a story, and not only you, um, about a visit in the 90s. Um, I was very engaged, and I am engaged for the opposition in Cuba. And I had good contact with Václav Havel about that. And then Václav Havel decided in the 90s that we should, uh, he would wanted to send a delegation from dissidents of Central and Eastern Europe uh, to Latin America uh, to convince the country there and uh, to understand better that Cuba is a dictatorship because very often in Latin America, Castro in that time was understood as a hero against the Americans. And so I was part of that delegation and Jan Rummel and other uh, uh, were there. And there was made, uh, in the first day, we had a meeting and discussed what is our message. And we saw that we had a strong disagreement about Mr. Reagan. And that's why I come to that point. You mentioned it. For you, I think in Poland and even in Czechoslovakia and other countries, Mr. Reagan was a hero. A hero for freedom, you thought. I never. Uh, and uh, we saw coming in East Germany, we had different position in that field. Uh, I think more similar to yours. That's why I raised that issue. And I told them, what is the view of the Latin Americans with Mr. Reagan? They had the experience that Mr. Reagan was supporting all these authoritarian systems even with Chile, uh, with Pinochet, even with the military dictature in Argentina, that was their view to Mr. Reagan. That was not your view. You lost this. But if you go to Latin America and tell them that Mr. Reagan is a hero for freedom, they ask you if you are right. Uh, and so I wanted to give you uh, that point. It is not so easy with a different perspective, even in that time and even in that person of Mr. Reagan. So I think in the question of communism, we were together fighting against it. But in the question of nuclear armament, that was not an every uh, point the same and the case. Um, I wanted only to mention that to make clear that it is much more difficult and much more differentiated. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the comment, Marcus. I, I don't think we have time to debate the positive and negative uh, aspects of Ronald Reagan, but I, I will grant you he had both. Okay, uh, please. Thank you. My name is Ion Ionica. I'm editor-in-chief of History Magazine in Bucharest, Romania. I, uh, I understand very well what you, Dr. Magellan, are saying. I understand your trauma and uh, the trauma of uh, Spanish Civil War. I understand very well what we are saying, Mr. Naimski. I'm coming from a former communist state, and I know 
the dictatorship of uh, communism in Romania was the most atrocious. Uh, the last years of Ceausescu dictatorship. And the Romanian revolution was a bloody one in Romania. So I can understand your different perspective, but my question is, uh, Mr. Dr. Magellan, have you seen a pacifist movement stopping an aggressor in history? In the First World War, in the Civil Spanish War, in the Second World War, it didn't work at all. It encouraged aggressor. And on the other hand, I believe, I strongly believe, the most important is to see who is the aggressor and who is the victim. In Spanish, Spanish population was the victim of war, victim of dictatorship. In our countries, we the people were the victim of communist dictatorship. So, when you see a woman attacked by a rapist trying to violate the woman, the woman is the victim. The rapist is the aggressor. And the most important for us, a moral thing for us, is to not be confused who is the victim and who is the aggressor. We have to stand against the aggressor and help the victim. Thank you. Of course, you are right. <clears throat> uh, the aggressor has to be stopped. And I don't judge anyone who defends themselves, Ukrainians and anyone, even myself. If I were attacked, I have to acknowledge that I have to uh, defend myself. But this is a question, and other is uh, that uh, to be um, in our mind that these courses build reality. If we always defend weapons, we never go out the weapons. So we have to, uh, to understand the people who defend themselves, but maintaining our discourse as a way different for cooperating, for living together pacifically. And my question is, how many efforts are, made, are being made to build, for instance, a ceasefire or a negotiation? Eh? Uh, how many efforts? So we have to maintain the two discourses not only defend to send weapons, to send weapons. And I say that in this country that we, uh, during the, rep the civil war, the Republic wanted weapons, wanted weapons, and Europe, uh, the democracies didn't send weapons to, to Spain, no? But in this legacy of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, they didn't ask for weapons for the Republican Spain. They wanted that Germany and Italy don't, didn't support the Franco's uh, uh, rebellion. So this is the coherence of one line of thinking. And we don't have solution. You are true. You are true. So this is true. But I want to maintain my discourse of pacifism. But I, as I say. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's not working. No, no. Uh, we need to pass the mic to our next uh, question or to our next lady questioner. Please. Mingaili Yurkuta from Lithuania, Genocide and Resistance Center. Um, uh, I really um, don't want to disrespect uh, your family history, uh, history of your grandmother or your beliefs on pacifism. I strongly support uh, peace myself. However, um, the, the statement that uh, 
when we're dealing with the totalitarian regimes, authoritarian regimes, uh, the way to respond to it is pacifism. It's actually a very, very disturbing uh, statement. And uh, that's why um, these kind of regimes, they do not respond with repression to how people are reacting. That's very important to understand this, um, um, this feature. They always come with a plan for repressions, for terror in advance. These are pre-planned pre things which are implemented in the mass population um, uh, without any regard how exact people are behaving. I mean, uh, it's not what you did, but it's who you are, the category you receive. It's why you receive the repression. So, the instance of my own country, or and any countries who were occupied by um, Soviet Union after Second World War, is this. But I will give the instance of my country because actually I know this the best. So um, we have a total number of 300,000 people repressed out of three million. So it's the big percentage. All those people, they were fa farmers mostly. They were not involved in a political life in any way. So those are uh, really innocent victims. Actually, this number is smaller, way smaller, in comparison with the number which was prepared before the occupation. And today, um, in the uh, situation of Ukraine, we have exactly the same model, because plans, they were uh, for terror, for repressions, they were made in advance. And exactly the same scheme. People were divided into categories and uh, four categories. Some of them were supposed to be killed, others were deported and so on. So it's very important to not miss this. It's very important. When the totalitarian regime is coming, um, it's the only way to deal with it is to stop it and not allow it to advance. That's the only possible reaction to a totalitarian regime. So. Um, there, there might be other situations when peace movements for peace um, are important, but not this one. So that was my first uh, remark, and the other remark um, concerns. The I'm afraid ground. we have to make uh, time for another question. So if you could please. Oh, but, but was, that was a positive one about the common ground. But okay, I will pass the mark. Uh, the I'm mic. sorry, I'm sorry, but I am afraid this was a comment. Uh, and a fair comment, but uh, I've been given a sign that we should be about to finish, so the last question will go to the gentleman here, and I'm sorry. Funciona? Is it working? Yeah. Okay. Iñaki Tofino from Barcelona. And, uh, well, I have a, a short remark on this, on what you just said, and following on what Dr. Magallon thinks, and I think, correct me if I'm wrong, if nobody, okay, when she says pacifism, it means that if no Russian wants to go to war, there's no war. No, I, no, I know, but that's, it's, it's like a utopia. The idea of if nobody wants to go to war, there will be no wars, okay? So that's what I think you were trying to say, maybe. I have a question for you, though, <clears throat> uh, Dr. Naimsky. It kind of surprised me that um, oh, it's going to be a difficult question. Uh, when you say that uh, Poles who um, were communists were traitors, you are actually, it reminds me of uh, Francoists saying that uh, people who were with the Republic were not Spaniards, they called them la anti-España. So, don't you think that your position kind of makes, impossible, makes reconciliation impossible? I am not saying that Polish communists, they were not Poles. Unfortunately, they were Poles. Uh, and uh, and I can also add that, you see, uh, I don't know, I didn't, didn't meet uh, any communist 
who, who was uh, a Democrat or for democracy. I met a series of former communists, dissidents, who changed minds and they became Democrats uh, or patriots, Polish patriots. But to be communist in Poland is something in, was something in contrary to being Polish patriot. Uh, let me one final, final remark on the gender aspect of the war. Uh, to me, uh, the victim, and for instance, in the Spanish Civil War was my father, who seven years of his jobs have to uh, go to fight with weapons against uh, first the war and then a civil uh, service in the stream of uh, Spain, Galicia, our Galicia, not your Galicia, and then <laughs> with all the people from Catalonia, all Catalan soldiers and Aragon went to Galicia. Well, and this Ukrainian war, at the beginning, women and children went out of the country, but men were obliged to fight, and some men wanted uh, to defend their right to no kill. So, who is the victim? Men are also victims, not only women. That's it. Oh. <laughs> well, uh, I acknowledge that there may be a, a case of such men who did not want to fight, but uh, uh, we have very little documentation of, uh, but this is the future. of that. Well, this is the future. I mean, the future is, uh, is, is, is next. But I will end on, and Piotr will forgive me, on, you know, Another point on historic complexity, and that touches upon Spain, touches upon Poland, touches upon uh, Czechoslovakia. In Poland, communism was largely an imported phenomenon. Poland was not an industrial country at the end of the First World War, and it did not have a, a massive communist movement. Czechoslovakia was one of the most industrial parts of Europe at the time. It had a very strong indigenous communist party. There were, before the war, there were people, intellectuals, who believed not because of Russian or Soviet indoctrination, but because of their own conviction in the idea as they must have been in Spain. So, I generally do not blame people who maybe mistakenly but in good faith uh, supported the communist idea before the Second World War. You know, anyone who supported it after 1968, you know, uh, must have had uh, something in his head missing. Or after 45, after 56, after 53. Yeah, okay. So we agree on that. And it's wonderful to end up on a note of uh, consensus. Uh, thank you very much. You were a wonderful audience. And thank Dr. Carmen Magallon. <laughs> and Dr. Piotr Naimski. Thank you very much.